You know, words matter. They do matter. After the first service, I, or during the first service, I made the statement that uh, relating to the storms last night, because I've only been here a year and a half, about a year, a little over a year, and I've never experienced a hurricane or even the torrential rains, I guess, that I saw. And so I made the statement that uh, our sofa was floating. And uh, someone came up to my partner and said, oh, you have, must have five feet of water in your house. So no, just two inches. It wasn't technically floating. It's just wet, but true. So words do matter. So I'm learning how much they matter. Um, so, you know, I'm usually an ex- extemporaneous preacher. My background is Baptist and Pentecostals, and I'm trying to get accustomed to the manuscript that, you know, most you Unitarian ministers use. <laughs> Brother Tom would know about that. So, you know, after, my, after that last service, I, I never had it happen to me, but in the middle of it, I just got frustrated and didn't want to read it anymore. So I took out about 11 pages. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, words do matter. So that's, that's the gist of what I want to talk about. I'm reading a quote from Judith Merrin. She says, the pejorative term political correctness was adapted to express disapproval of the enlargement of etiquette to cover all people, in spite of this being a principle to which all Americans claim to subscribe. And so in this very volatile election year, it is easy to find a scapegoat to demonize. And it appears that one such culprit is the idea or their concept of political correctness. Originally a pejorative phrase, like we just said, that stemmed from the anti-PC movement, it is now used vocally in discouraging respectful dialogue and decent public decorum. People, politicians, and preachers alike have decided that it is now in to be able to say whatever is on one's mind, no matter who it offends. This new clarion call to offend those who embrace political correctness has created a climate of anger, disillusionment, and downright nastiness. There is a great political and social divide not that we were ever truly together, but there, there have been some progress, some semblance of unity, some work towards reconciliation, some hard work towards equality. And while the work is still ongoing, the divide, in some respect, has increased. Personally, I can't recall a time in my adult years where I have witnessed such a dire state of affairs, where long-term friends no longer speak, once close siblings are now estranged, neighbors in constant conflict, racial and political animus rampant. It is not just here in the U.S., it's all over the globe. It seems as if the world has lost its collective mind, its sense of fairness, and in some cases, its own Humanity, how do we survive such a state? Now, the irony is somewhat lost when a phrase that has at its core the word correct is now somehow wrong, thus incorrect. Now, I really didn't set out to make a political speech, but I soon realized that it would be difficult since there is the, this little word pol- political. <laughs> in my title. But as a minister, I realized my responsibilities in negotiating the intricacies of politics and religion as it relates to church and state. So I'm hopeful that this reflection will be a little light on the political side. But on one side of the divide, we have those who defend political correctness, who stand on the Constitution which declares in its supposition that all are created equal, having been endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, among them the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. While on the other side, the opponents 
who also have as their defender the Constitution, but particularly the First Amendment, which grants them freedom of speech and religion, which can often be interpreted to mean that they have the right to say whatever they choose to say when they want to say it. Now, we know that that is within reason, even if it conflicts with their opponent's own pursuit of equality. Christian author and columnist, the Reverend Michael Bresciani asserts, quote, the primary thrust of political correctness is the elimination of offense or contrary speech that may offend or point out particular behaviors, casting them as un favorable in an unfavorable light. It is like the old communistic effort of the KGB to silence all speech against the state. But in today's PC, it is a voluntary program that you are not forced to obey, but woe to you if you don't. It is the acceptable form of collective dishonesty that seemed to protect Everyone, while it suggests that doing, seeing, or promoting sin or bad behavior is not wrong. Only talking about it is wrong. He goes further. Political correctness is a societal perversion parading as, as an effort toward civility and world peace. In fact, it is a bulldozer sent to level all resistance by labeling free speech and honesty as evil. It is one of the greatest evils of our time, masquerading as a knight in shining armor. PC is the little white fences and chutes that the sheep travel through, deliberately driven in fear by the calls and pokes of the herders who are leading them directly to the place of slaughter, end quote. Stay with me now. <laughs> so I just I have decided that because all those 15 pages that I took out that we'd open up for dialogue so you just hold your horses we, I want to talk to you in a little bit <laughs> so another witness best selling author and human relations expert B.J. Gallagher she also believes as the first one does that political correctness has gone way too far. In her attempt, and this is a long quote, in her attempt to respond to what she believes as are the errors of political correctness, she suggests, quote, how are we ever going to be able to live and work together more comfortably if there's a whole herd of elephants in the room? If we can't talk about our feelings, fears, aspirations, anxieties, assumptions, hopes, worries, dreams, and concerns, how can we ever build trust with those who are different from us? If we can't talk about our differences, about the differences that puzzle us, or things we're curious about without fear of giving offense, then how can we ever overcome our ignorance about cultures and races, or even the opposite sex? She goes further. If we must constantly self-censor any conversation pertaining to race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, or physical ability, then we are doomed to perpetuate the very barriers we say we want to overcome. To those who serve in today's PC police, I understand that your intentions are good, but there are often a big gap between intent and impact. I would invite you to consider the impact of your censorship and finger wagging, as well as your inclination of self-righteous moral indignation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I wasn't supposed to do that there. You don't. The political correct thing was continue. Finish the quote. You don't realize it, but you're effectively throwing a wet blanket over public and private discussions of vitally important issues, she asserts. You've gone too far in your efforts to protect everyone's feelings. You're essentially imposing a gag order on the whole of American society. 
And in so doing, you're hindering our progress in getting to know one another, to understand others, different perspectives, viewpoints, feelings, and life experiences. Lighten up. Please resign from the PC police. Give us all a break, end quote, and amen. She says, lighten up. Now, while I personally appreciate the arguments that any public discourse is good, I cannot fully agree. You see, often, I've not just been offended by a lot of the assertions that have been made. Sometimes I feel outright threatened. Now, when someone says that they're going to pass an amendment to the Supreme Court that will annul my marriage to my partner. That's not a conversation starter, my friend. That's a threat. And when someone says that they're going to um, pass a law, well, they passed a law (laughs) requiring that you attend the restroom of your birth or you, you go to the restroom of your birth gender, that's not a conversation starter. For those who have to enter in, it's a threat. So I believe that conversations are to be had, but we must overcome the threats. Those of us who have done and are still doing the work realize that these conversations must take place in safe spaces. The public forum is not the best place for people to adequately learn what needs to be learned about one another. And we can see this happening in our world today. I feel that we should not be having these very public conversations before we first have had the very private ones. What has been revealed as of late, and if you have listened to the the news lately, about a person's very now public, vulgar, private conversation is kind of like the prime example I'm trying to make. Here is the challenge for all of us. We must be able to have decent and moral communication and behaviors when we are in our safe zones or in our private zones, when we are among our circles of trust, before we can have those public, those public conversations. But those conversations in those private and personal things must be politically correct, <laughs> in a sense. Stay with me. Time and time again, I see racist, misogynistic, and xenophobic posts on social media, which often goes unchallenged. Not from those on the opposite side of an issue, but from those within the same camp, and it bothers me immensely. How is it that so many people are okay with the things they hear and see among their own circles of trust? Places where they hang out. When you are with those that you feel safe with. When you hear or see something and you yet you don't challenge it. Did you not know that your silence can be considered tacit approval? Whether you are a college kid or In a fraternity or a stock red Walmart, we just cannot let offensive words and deeds go unchallenged. Remember, when you are in those private moments to honor your own integrity, but stand up for the voice that cannot be heard. We realize that with the advent of social media, that our world has grown smaller and closer and Globalization is a reality, and as a result, we must learn to interact with one another. We must learn to interact with our foreign neighbors. Political correctness recognizes that there will always be more than one voice in the room. 
If we are to grow as a people, as a community, we must embrace our intersectionality. We must learn with someone of another culture, belief, worldview, gender identity. We know that productive conversation cannot start where people are offended or when they feel threatened. Not only in their pursuit of happiness, but in their very way they live, in their safety. We cannot insult our way to equality. I contend that one cannot evangelize and antagonize at the same time. We cannot win hearts with meanness and disrespect. If you are making a point and I'm feeling threatened by what you are saying, it is not likely I will be able to hear a word you're saying. And let it be known that we are not trying to stop any conversation from happening, but there is a way of doing it, a political correct way of initiating conversation. How are we to interact with one another is pivotal to how the conversation moves forward. And while many are becoming masters at closing down conversations with their refusal to utilize inclusive language, there are those who are about to gra- who are among us who are about to graduate from PC Academy, knowing that this is the ever evolving language and how necessary it is to change the world. And especially for public servants who are commissioned to serve the public without bias and prejudice. Their service is inextricably linked to trust, and thus their words hold a great deal of power. And yet we have witnessed and we are witnessing police officers, congressmen and women, town mayors, governors and presidential candidates make truly astounding remarks, comments at which many of us will gasp. We have not heard in a public forum such debauchery. And these are not the kinds of things that bring us together or encourage trust. When it comes to building trust, each party must have some degree of integrity. There must also be some regard and care about the the other person with whom you're trying to build that trust. If we clean up our private conversations, our public dialogue will be cleaned up as well. And so, Let us remember that there are some rules to engagement. Like any skill set, there must be a willingness to learn. There must be some interest in the field of study. There must be an application of the skilled learning. I want to talk to you a little bit about my experience with the church in Tulsa. And I shared this the last time I was here about a year ago. If many of you remember how I'm from a uh, predominantly Pentecostal background and we were in a part of a church where a preacher abandoned the orthodox Christian teachings and started preaching a universalism. And as you might imagine, the whole church, well, many of those in Christendom, and I would say fundamentalist Christianity, uh, kicked him and us out of the church, basically. He was rendered a heretic and we lost our building and lost everything simply because we believe that all people are safe. <laughs> and so we were homeless and we ended up joining All Souls Unitarian Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So if you have heard this, if it bears repeating, I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat it for this point. And so can you imagine when 1100 Pentecostal Universalists joined a Unitarian church? <laughs> what might have happened. And we like to say that from Unitarians, I've heard it from one church, I've heard it in several. All are welcome. Yes, all are welcome except Jesus. And when Jesus showed up, he was too loud. He played drums. He clapped his hands and he moved too much. And he didn't know the words to the hymns. But as you might imagine, all hell broke loose. And, and I contend, I'll tell you what happened, and I, we'll, we'll talk about this and open up for dialogue. But 
we got together, and the group was called a mosaic group. It was a mosaic group that got together. All the people came together, and they sat down. They tried to work through their differences, and that actually caused more problems, more chaos, more problems. And it wasn't until, I mean, people left the church. It was, it was just, it was horrific. But it wasn't until uh, the YWCA, I believe, approached us with a new program, and it was a caucus program. And it's where the people of color got together and the Caucasian people got together. Okay? And they, the, the Caucasian people learned uh, the, reading, the book Witnessing Whiteness. And the people of color is the, read from the book, Why Do All the Black Kids Sit Together in a Cafeteria? And they read that for six to eight weeks, I believe it was. They worked through politically correct language, but nuances culture and differences in their safe spaces. And then they came together after the end of that program and they shared some very unique experiences and then they were able to talk and communicate. This happened in the private safe space where it could, where a Caucasian person could say them or or say something that, that a person of color might take offense to. But they were safe and they understood that and they worked through that. But one of the uh, examples I heard from a, when we all came together as a group, one of the Caucasian brothers uh, said one of his revelations was that he understood that whiteness, as he said, can no longer be the social norm, the standard bearer or the epitome of what was beautiful. He didn't realize up to that point that what the standard was. This was such a revelation to the whole group as he shared that, that everyone began to open up more dialogue and discuss and talk about uh, what was going on. Now, I contend, and I'll open this up in in discussions right here in just a couple of minutes, but I contend that what had happened to that church, and as I see what is happening in our nation right now, is that there's a loss of identity. And if you ever dealt with organizational change management, that's the business side of me. Okay, again. But if you understand that when a church or when an organization goes through change, there is this temporary sense of loss of identity that happens in almost all cases. And what I believe that's happening with the advent of, of, of you know, Hispanics coming, you know, and, and, the, and, and, and the, the, the Spanish language being spoken quite often. And we see this this demographic Change, And then we see uh, how marriage quality has come and all the changes that are taking place, that there's a sense of identity, a loss of identity that's happening in our nation. And so with that said, there's this fear that has crept in and then people are really unstable in this sense. And what we're seeing in our nation with the dialogue is the result of that experience. That's what I contend. I kind of gave you the answer before we had the discussion. So... (laughs) Don't hold me to that. But what I want to do right now is to open the discussion up before I, I do my conclusion. Who's got the mic? And All right. And I want to talk about just a little brief dialogue, what you're seeing in the world. But do you agree with the first two um, uh, quotes that I read about people who believe that political correctness has gone too far? Right. And I know you're Unitarian, so I know you're going to talk. So come on. <laughs> We, I know you have a lot of questions, so yes. Uh, well, I live in very cool Carborough on a very cool street and have a very cool rock and roll band across the street, and they have a very cool, very old truck. And they've put on the back of the truck, um, Hillary in 2016 in prison. And I'm just beside myself to see this truck because I leave it in the street to walk past it to see that it, it just... I just bubble up, and I, I don't know them, uh, this group that lives across the street. Um, and so I, I don't know how to have that conversation. Like, um, I, I don't know if they think it's funny, if they mean it seriously. Uh, so again, it's like this personal conversation that I'm not having with someone right across the street from me. Okay. And I would contend that you know, it, it, when, you, when you wanted to have a conversation, both parties have to be willing to communicate. Uh, I don't know why people put bumper stickers or, you know, I talk to my partner about uh, uh, quotes on Facebook all the time because he's one that really wants to just get in people's faces and do that. And I said, if it's not touching, moving and inspiring people, 
we shouldn't even post it. But he just, he loves it. He fights and he gets in there, but I just, I don't do it. It's like the song that, uh, that was sang today about, uh, about, what was it? Necessary truth. Yeah, necessary truth. I mean, so the idea would be, how do we get past that? And so you may want to see if they're willing to have a conversation a sit down conversation, but I would have some guidance on how that can proceed forward. Uh, uh, if people don't want to speak to you, they want to insult you, and they come with the talking points, that's not a conversation starter. I mean, that's, that's going to, you, know, you know that's going to end. And so uh, I see that happening all over, and I know we all do. Uh, I've got one back here and one here. Real quick. I would like to re- replace the phrase politically correct with the word respect. I like that. <laughs> so it's part of it. Uh, and this respect, absolutely. Thank you. In um, John Stuart Mill's text on liberty, he talks about the importance of freedom of speech. And one of the arguments that he gives to support it is that um, if you allow people to speak their mind, then you know the enemy, basically. Um, I mean, you know what you're up against. And so I, I like the idea of people being able to say whatever's on their mind, but I think it's important to do it in a respectful way. And the most important thing we can do, given that context, is to have the courage to stand up and say something. I remember being um, probably a 19-year-old riding the subway in New York City, and there was a man on the train Um, saying that every single lesbian and gay was going to hell. And my parents are lesbian. And it was hard for me, but I stood up and I said something and I yelled it on the train, even though I was afraid he might shoot me and that he was crazy and might have a gun. Um, I um, I don't always have the courage to do that, but I'm trying to make sure that when people say something with which I strongly disagree and find offensive, that I have the courage to say something in response. So, and I really appreciate what she said. She said she, she appreciated people speaking their minds. Um, I, you know, the last eight years with the advent of uh, Barack Obama's um, presidency, I've heard a lot of people speak their minds. And uh, as a person of color, I have been so wounded that I have calluses uh, over my heart uh, now because I've heard people speak their minds. And they have spoken their minds, and I know that it reflects on, on my color as my, and my race in many instances. Um, what I don't understand is how, and I appreciate you saying what you said, the latter part is that I, when I see it, I have to respond. Because what I'm seeing is that a lot of people are not responding. And, and, and it hurts when I see this stuff and people are saying, well, it's just political speech. It's just uh, people speaking their minds. Well, it it hurts. <laughs> it, it hurts. And, 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 and I'm threatened in, in many instances. And until you understand the reversal of that, until you understand and walk in my shoes, or I can imagine what the president or his children are experiencing, but until you walk in those shoes, um, I would argue speaking, one, speaking your mind is, 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 is not as important as my safety. And they're not uh, comparable. Okay. Um. I am a teacher, and I teach at a Montessori school, so I have fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in my class. And we just had a conversation the past day, um, the past week, about rumors, because there was a rumor going around that one of the children brought to my attention, and she was really upset about it because it was about her. And one of the things we talked about was that um, this idea of think, so T-H-I-N-K, And it goes back to kind of what the song was talking about. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? (laughs) Um, And if it isn't any of those things, then it's something that you just think, and it's not something you speak. And if you need to get it out, that there are ways to do that and to find the right words to say so that you can say what you are meaning without hurting the people around you, And then the idea that I think, personally, a lot of the problem that we're running into these days is because we focused on tolerance instead of respect and understanding. And if you look at the definition of tolerate, it means to allow another way of practicing or living or being 
And so in the definition, there's this idea that if I am allowing you to live your life your way, then I have some right to give you wow. the right to live the way that you're living. And frankly, you don't have that right over me, and I don't have that right over you. So we need to seek not to tolerate each other or not tolerance of other cultures, but understanding and respect of them. Wow. <laughs> well said. We got one more. We got time for one more. And then we got to close out the ceremony. Just two points, and I'll try to be quick. Um, one thing is that in terms of being offended by other people's statements, I, I feel like there's too much emphasis put on interpretation over intent. You know, and you really have to consider someone else's intent when they speak as opposed to how you personally want to interpret it right off the bat, you know? And um, the other thing, uh, just in terms of when you're having a dialogue with someone with whom you might agree, what I find most productive to do in such a circumstance is to say why. Like, ask them, why do you think that? Because then you're not just attacking their ideas, you're giving them a chance to explain, and you're also at least making it look like you care, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, that's with the Hillary sticker. <laughs> Ask them why they think that way, and tell them not to use a talking.